Ever since I began the epic talking series of videos on this channel, I've been fascinated with tracing the historical development of the musical algorithms that define the sound of music in this region that I refer to as West Eurasia, sort of West Asia, the Middle East, Europe, also including North Africa, even though it's not Eurasia. Now, usually we don't speak of these three regions in the same breath. Uh, we don't put them into one category, but musically it does work from a historical angle because the main musical algorithms that define the sound of those regions musically uh, have a shared history of development with one another. I always put it in very oversimplified terms that Middle Eastern music and European music um, are like two diverging branches of what was originally the same evolutionary origin. It's oversimplified, but it does have some truth to it. Now, if you've been watching all my epic talking videos, you know all about that already. This is not going to be news to you. However, I felt that making this video would be necessary just to have kind of like the entirety of the main information put into one video that allows us to have one big overview of the entire thing. Um, you know, it's good to have a picture of a rock that is zoomed in in Africa so you can understand, I don't know, the mineral composition of, of the African continent, but you also sometimes need a picture of Africa from space to see the whole thing from beginning to end. So maybe this video will be redundant for some, and I did want to make videos talking about something else completely, but um, for now, let's talk about this, you know, let's just get this one out of the way because I think it's going to be practical to just have one big overview from beginning to end in one video. Also, another reason that I'm making this video is because this video is going to be a reworking of two previous videos that I made. They're now going to be unlisted and be put in the description of this video. The reason I'm doing this is because um, one of those videos was about the Middle Eastern influence on European music and how a lot of things that we typically just take for granted as being European actually have a Middle Eastern origin. And conversely, a lot of things that we think of as having a typically Middle Eastern sound um, actually have a European Greek origin seemingly based on the evidence and a lot of European morons or Western morons were like oh you know this guy has an agenda he's Iranian look at his face of course he would say that and then Middle Eastern morons would be saying that oh this guy has a he's Canadian so of course he would say that uh, he has an agenda he has an anti-European bias and Middle Eastern, he has an anti-Middle Eastern bias. I was getting tired of these uh, kind of comments. So uh, hopefully by putting the two influences in one video, uh, any moron now will be accusing me of having some sort of bias, even though I will have the sources and the evidence in the video. Um, at that point, if you want to debate me on that, just go debate the experts, because all I'm communicating is the expert uh, unanimous agreements. Uh, at that point, the moronic being of these people will hopefully be a little more, a uh, little more evident. <laughs> Now, our story begins in Mesopotamia. Obviously, the history of music does not begin in Mesopotamia. We know music predates Mesopotamia by hundreds of thousands of years. But our story begins with Mesopotamia. And why does it begin there? Because our earliest evidence of written down music theory is found in Mesopotamia. This is a concept that is going to be central to this video because evidence bias shapes our understanding of music theory. Our evidence on ancient music is very limited, especially before the Middle Ages, and that is obviously going to influence how we view the history. You know, some people say that you have a, an apparent ancient Greek bias. You always talk about ancient Greek music theory, but you conveniently don't mention Indian or Iranian music. How biased? And it's like, yeah, I only mention ancient Greek music theory because that's the one that we have evidence of. I can't just pull stuff out of my posterior, pardon the expression, um, so that I may seem unbiased. We have access to ancient Greek music theory, so that's the one that I can sort of talk about. So obviously, lack of evidence and limited evidence will structure how we talk about things. Now, the earliest evidence that we have is in Mesopotamia. And our understanding of Mesopotamian music, the part that is without doubt, that we knew of for sure, is that Mesopotamian music was heptatonic and diatonic. That they divided the octave into seven parts, seven notes, and that these intervals had diatonic intervals. It's a sort of division of the octave that will produce melodies that sound like this. Basically, it's going to give us Western European sounding uh, melodies, Western European sounding modes. Modes are a specific configuration or arrangement of notes within the octave. And the reference that we have in the modern day for these is Western Europe. So diatonic melodies would have been very familiar to modern Western European ears. Basically, if it's not diatonic, then it's going to sound very exotic or strange to a Western European ear. This is a shock for many people because many people have this instinct that they just picture how Middle Eastern music sounds today and they just jump to the conclusion, well, that's how it must have always sounded. 
throughout history, but that's not how things work. Um, what we call Middle Eastern music today is the confluence and the convergence of many different influences and uh, different innovations that occur throughout time and crystallize at a certain point in time to give us the sound that we have today. This kind of sound, as far as we know, did not exist back in Mesopotamia. So Mesopotamian music of the day would have sounded very, very unfamiliar to modern Middle Eastern ears. Now, there's other things that are possible, but that are not established as fact, like the diatonicism of the Mesopotamian system. One of those competing models is that of Anne Kilmer. Now, Anne Kilmer's interpretation of the Hurrian hymns, the source that lets us know about Mesopotamian music, is that they would have had instances of verticality, that they would have had two melodies played at the same time. Now, let's take a break here. Verticality, let's open a parenthesis. What does verticality mean in this context? A horizontal musical tradition is one where the entire performance is about the development of one sole melodic line. So suppose that you have 15 people playing different instruments and you have a vocalist, they're all playing the same melody more or less. They might be ornamenting it a little bit differently, each and every one of them, but at the end of the day, they're playing fundamentally the same melody. By contrast, you have vertical musical traditions. And the best example for me, the crowning achievement of uh, vertical musical traditions is the Western tradition. The Western tradition is absolutely the one that has developed it to the furthest extent throughout its history. You look at the Game of Thrones theme, you have a main melody. Da, 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 da. The, sorry, that's the riff. You have a riff and then above it you have the main melody. Da, 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 da. Now these are two independent melodic structures but they're occurring at the same time. They're layered on top of one another vertically. That's what a vertical musical tradition is. Now, you know, in legal terms, when we talk about innocent until proven guilty, in music history, the attitude is horizontal until proven otherwise. We know nothing about Gaulish music, but if you are to tell a music historian, I'm just going to assume Gaulish music was horizontal, they won't, like, argue with you. They'll be like, yeah, sure. Uh, if you are to say, I believe Gauls had vertical elements to their music, then they're going to be like, whoa, you need proof for this. Basically, horizontality is overwhelmingly the norm across humanity, so there's no burden of proof for it. Verticality occurs far more rarely, and therefore, um, that is where the burden of proof lies on. So, in order to claim that an ancient musical tradition would have had elements of verticality, that is basically an exceptional claim in the field of music history, and exceptional claims, as we know, require exceptional evidence. Does Anne Kilmer have exceptional evidence? She does not. She has conjecture, she has a certain interpretation of the Hurrian hymns that is not impossible, but not impossible is not evidence. It's, it's a possible interpretation and we would need more evidence in order to declare it as fact. Similarly, you have another side of the spectrum, which is the uh, Richard Dumbrell side of things. Now, Richard Dumbrell, um, you know, I earlier on said that Mesopotamian music would not have been recognizably like Middle Eastern music of today. It would not have functioned on the basis of the Maram system. The Maram system is what makes Middle Eastern music sound the way it does today. Um, Richard Dumbrell's claim is that actually, no, the Maram system as we know it today would have existed back uh, and that many exotic scales from a Western European perspective, you know, you have Maram Hijazkar, for example, or um, the double harmonic major in Western terminology. Uh, that's not a diatonic division of the octave, that's a chromatic division of the octave. And um, did these scales exist in Mesopotamia? Richard Dumbrell claims so, and so some of his reconstructions of Mesopotamian music, of the Hurrian hymns, will actually employ Hijazkar, but Again, um, this is conjecture, it's possible, it's not impossible, but there's no evidence for it. So all we know for a fact is that, Mesop is that Mesopotamian music would have worked on the basis of a horizontal diatonic modality. Any other claim requires evidence that we do not have so far. Our next step in this evolutionary history is ancient Greece. Now, the ancient Greece we know adopted the diatonic modality of the Mesopotamians. This is apparent in the fact that Mesopotamia and Egypt both exerted incredible influence on the ancient Greeks. We know that Pythagoras traveled to Egypt uh, where he picked up elements of music theory. Unfortunately, we know nothing about the music theory of ancient Egypt, so we can't really know what these consist of. But we do know about the Mesopotamian part and we know that the diatonic modality made its way to ancient Greece and it formed the bulk of uh, part of the bulk of classical Greek music because we find the same Mesopotamian modes in the same order, in the same arrangement. And what happens next is the ancient Greeks seem to innovate on top of that basic diatonic modality and they add to it two additional forms of division of the octave, the chromatic and the enharmonic. Chromatic and enharmonic become 
two alternative ways of dividing the octave that produce different scales, different sounds. Chromatic especially will give us the basis of modes like Hijazkar, again, Hijazkar that I talked about earlier. Um, that is actually found, its first four notes, its first tetrachord is found in the Lydian chromatic mode. And its second tetrachord is found in the ancient Greek chromatic hypolydian mode. That's where Hijazkar seems to have originated in the first place. A lot of people would assume it comes from Mesopotamia or from some Mesopotamia, Middle Eastern origin because it sounds Middle Eastern to our ears. But again, remember, these are modern associations. Just because they sound Middle Eastern to us is not indicative that they must have come from the Middle East. And the earliest attestations of them is in ancient Greece. Now, does that mean that the origin is ancient Greece? Not necessarily. Again, evidence bias. That's the earliest piece of evidence that we have. And there's many centuries separating the earlier Mesopotamian diatonic developments from the later ancient Greek developments of chromatic and enharmonic modality. So there's very much a possibility that, um, you know, the ancient Greeks may have picked it up from some other people or maybe they innovated it completely. I asked Stefan Hagel about this. Stefan Hagel who is an expert on ancient Greek and uh, ancient Mesopotamian music theory. And he was very kind to answer to me. And what he told me was that, listen, um, there's no reason to think that it must have necessarily come from the East. Again, outside of projecting a stereotype of it sounds Eastern, therefore it has to come from the East. Um, outside of that, there's no reason not to think that it could have been innovated by the Greeks. Some of his more careful colleagues, the way that he worded it, is that some of his more careful colleagues are like, listen, maybe some other kind of scales flew under the radar and we just don't know about them. That's a possibility that we have to consider, sure. But we just don't know. As far as we know, the innovation might have been ancient Greek. Now, whether or not the ancient Greeks innovated it, what matters is that they were the first to codify it in this specific music theory arrangement. And this specific music theory, with that arrangement, with that kind of language, with that kind of structure, is the one that is going to influence the Arabs at the onset of the Islamic Golden Age and really form part of the bulk of Middle Eastern music as we know it today. So again, whether or not the ancient Greeks developed the, the entire thing from the get-go is ultimately irrelevant. Their structurization, if that's a word, their, their, the way that they structured those elements and created their music theory, that is the one that is going to influence Middle Eastern music later on, as well as other influences. Now, the ancient Greeks, of course, are conquered by the Romans, and the Romans create the synthesis that we can refer to as Greek or Roman civilization of antiquity. And at that time, at that point... The ancient Greek music theory becomes basically Roman theory. We know they're indistinguishable at a certain point. They basically use the, the exact same music theory, um, possibly with regional differences, obviously, but the bulk of the music theory would have been the same. And from there on, ancient Greek music is propagated throughout the Mediterranean and makes its way across the Mediterranean. Now we go to our next chapter. At our next chapter, we are now at the junction of antiquity and the Middle Ages. Antiquity is drawing to a close, and you have the Western Roman Empire and the Eastern Roman Empire. And here, for me, occurs the first, the first split in what will become the Eastern versus Western distinction of music in this region. In the territories of the Northwestern Roman Empire, we talked about how the ancient Greeks developed on top of diatonic modality and harmonic and chromatic modality, different forms of... Um, melodies that sound more exotic and non-European-like to our ears. But then in the northwestern parts of the Roman Empire, at the onset of the Middle Ages, the chromatic modes and the enharmonic modes die out as main ways of writing melodies, and basically only diatonic modes remain. This is why if you listen to medieval European melodies from the Middle Ages, none of them sound, none of them have the Hijaz Karmagam, none of them sound exotic they all sound very much i'm talking about the melodies i'm not talking about instruments because some people they're like oh it still sounds exotic to me yeah maybe the vocal production is exotic maybe the sound of instruments we're talking about the melodies only uh, the melodies are pretty much like modern conventional european melodies of today at that point that is because by the end of the end of antiquity they disappear in the territory of the northwestern roman empire however they continue to exist in the eastern parts, the Eastern Roman Empire. Indeed, the Greeks in their territories very much hold on to their ancient traditions of chromatic and enharmonic modality and rearrange them in what will become the Byzantine chant modes and the, the new, you know, that's why you get Hijaz Kar Maram in Byzantine chant in the Middle Ages. And that's why some people refer to this mode as Byzantine scale. Um, from the end of antiquity, they still had it. They just rearranged it in different manners as well as still using diatonic modality and everything. So what you see here is an early split between West and East. That's sort of like the first split, in my opinion, where Northwestern Europe really sticks to a diatonic form of melody, uh, to a diatonic sound, whereas in the East, East of Italy, uh, chromatic and enharmonic still thrive. Now, at that point,
point in history, you have two main hubs of knowledge and science. And music is indistinguishable from science at the time. You have to understand, nowadays we think of music as a purely artistic thing that is removed from science. So we think of a scientist and a musician as two opposite kinds of people. The musician is creative and crazy, and the scientist is rational and everything. And this is an idea that the ancients would not have recognized at all. And there were two hubs of science at the time in the East, the Eastern Roman Empire and the Sasanian Empire. Some authors have referred to them as the two eyes of the world. It cannot be really put into words just how advanced these two civilizations were. They were the two superpowers of the time. These two hubs of knowledge will serve as ready sources for a new player that comes in the region around the 7th century. Bolstered by their newfound religion, the Muslim Arabs leave the Arabian Peninsula. And at that time, they were very cognizant of the fact that technologically and scientifically they were behind uh, compared to other civilizations by a factor of centuries. I mean, they were not a very advanced civilization by the time they just left the, you know, the Arabian Peninsula. They were very much behind on these terms due to centuries-long, millennia-long relative isolation from the rest of the world. Relative, not complete, of course. Um, that is why the Prophet Muhammad in one of the hadiths, I believe, says, go seek, seek knowledge as far as China if you have to. And that is why they target Iran and the territories of the Eastern Roman Empire. Primarily, one of the reasons was, of course, not just the expansion of Islam, but also they knew there's knowledge there, there's sciences there, and we have to adapt it and we have to absorb that. And that's very much what they did. Just like the ancient Greeks originally absorbed um, the influence and the knowledge of more advanced civilizations that were older than them, so do the Arabs do at that stage in the Middle Ages. The Arabs conquered the Sasanian, Sasanian Empire, uh, where you had the great universities of Gondishapur and everything, where Indian sciences and Iranian and Middle Eastern and Mesopotamian Babylonian sciences were synthesized under the rule of the likes of Khosrau and Ushiravan. And then they conquered the Near Eastern provinces. They get Alexandria, Egypt, Damascus, Antioch, etc., some of the most advanced places on earth where ancient Greek knowledge and Roman knowledge was synthesized under the Eastern Roman Empire. And they use these two bases of knowledge, these two pillars, to propulse themselves into the age of the Islamic Golden Age. And music is very much part of that. Arabic music of that era initially was the synthesis of Iranian influence and Eastern Roman influence, ancient Greek influence. And the Arab writers of the early Middle Ages consistently refer back to ancient Greek music as one of the pillars of their music. They say we are using the tetrachords of Aristoxenos and everything. We are repurposing ancient Greek music theory. And again, this is why looking at the available data, it's impossible that it's Arabic or Turkish influence that brought Maram Hijazkar to Greece. Uh, but it is very possible that it's the Greeks who, you know, uh, influenced the Turks and the Arabs who absorbed these elements. Again, things aren't as clear cut as we might think. We might think this sounds Middle Eastern, therefore it comes from the Middle East. Sometimes it's the other way around. It's a little bit more complicated than that. But basically, Middle Eastern music as we know it today takes shape in this era. That is the era in which we can safely assume that Middle Eastern as we know it today uh, begins existing. At the point where Arabs synthesize uh, the earlier innovations of the Eastern Romans and the Iranians. Of course, since then, Middle Eastern music has changed. New instruments have come into play. Um, you know, new forms and styles have, have, em have emerged. But ultimately, the musical style, the main musical algorithm is largely the same. A horizontal musical tradition that is about ornamenting the melodic line with as much complex modality, different scales and everything. That is why in the East, they sing like ah, all these ornaments, all these tw twirls and curls and everything because it's about the melody, the horizontal line and how you can complexify it. And so you have this so-called Eastern musical province, if you will, this Eastern musical tradition of uh, horizontally driven modality characterized by modality rooted in the chromatic and enharmonic and diatonic modes of ancient Greece, going back to Mesopotamia in the case of the diatonic modes. That really covers sort of the Middle East, North Africa, and the Eastern Mediterranean, the Eastern Romans being very much part of that musical province, which is why I sort of oppose calling this Middle Eastern music because Eastern Roman music was not only a key player, innovator, and originator of that style, it's always been Greek music part of that style for the most part um, and it sort of you know starts overlapping out of it in the Balkans but the Balkans also have features that are that are tied to it but in Western Europe things keep drifting away and becoming very interesting at this point the relationship between the ancient Greek modality that is still very much thriving uh, in a new form in the East has pretty much died out in Western European music and instead Western European music has reduced itself down to a mostly diatonic component and on the basis of that diatonic component, you have the rise of organum. 
talked about in this video. Now, the rise of organum gives you the first time that two people start, or more than two people, start singing two or more different notes at the same time. Verticality, two or more different notes happening at the same time. That is what we call harmony. Whenever you have two or more different notes happening at the same time, this is what we refer to as harmony. So if I push these three buttons on a piano, I'll have a certain type of harmony. If I push these three buttons on a piano, then I'll have another form of harmony. And in the late Middle Ages, you see the explosion of full-blown polyphony that really crystallizes in Renaissance. Polyphony being six, uh, you know, four, three, six different melodies happening at the same time. Again, go watch the video on organum. That's going to give you much more of a... Uh, of a of a breakdown of what this entails and the development of harmony in western european music really causes a paradigm shift see the eastern traditions are very much about spontaneous improvisation ornamentation on the spot uh, you don't learn things everybody always asks me can you give me the tabs or the i don't i'm i'm, I'm from a middle eastern tradition originally i just learn things by ear um, everything works by ear there you just learn by ear you improvise on the spot you know it's not like you have a written down piece of paper the complexity and the genius of middle eastern music is more like modern american jazz for example where it's more about spontaneous improvisation and everything um, it's not about being tied exactly to the written down material and that's also how how medieval music was for the most part uh, in Europe for most of its history but at the point where verticality complex verticality becomes necessary um, then it becomes necessary to write down the performance beforehand because now you have the likes of Guillaume de Machaut who are telling their singers during this 30 minute performance I need you to sing this note here you to sing exactly this note here and this note and this note this causes, first off, a reduction of spontaneous ornamentation. Now you can't have everybody going, la, you know, and singing like this, which is, by the way, how many medieval Europeans sang, as I talk about in this video. Now it has to be simplified, the singing style, into pom, ta, 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 ha, ha, ha. You know, that's how you get a more conventional Western European style of singing that is less ornate. Why? because you need people to reduce the horizontal lines to their absolute simplest form in order to secure the vertical complexity. It also causes a paradigm shift in terms of writing. Now you need everybody to hit exact notes at an exact time singing together. You need to have standardized notation that people can follow. And so this creates a paradigm shift where much of the art music of Western Europe, especially after the Baroque era, becomes more and more tied to the written down material to the point where the written down material is exactly what you're going to get. What you have on paper with Mozart's or Beethoven's music is exactly what you're going to hear. You know, I know people who are really only limited to classical Western European music who say that oh these two performances of Mozart's Sonata are completely different from their point of view it's completely different from the point of view of somebody like me who's more used to Indian classical music or Middle Eastern classical music they're the exact same right because in in traditions outside of art music of Western Europe every two performances no two performances are going to be the same they're going to be completely different from, from one another and so at that point basically you have this complete um, split in the Western and Eastern traditions. The Eastern traditions continue to cultivate a 2,500 year old tradition reaching back to ancient Greece, which is about complex modality that is really where complexity lines on the horizontal line. Whereas in the West, um, it really breaks off from those ancient Greek roots and instead really begins in the Middle Ages. And in the Middle Ages, you have a reduction of modality down to a diatonic component. And then that diatonic component becomes the basis for a form of vertical complexity that is unlike any scene anywhere in the world to this day. Um, and it gives you the Renaissance and the harmony and everything. And that brings about the birth of the tonal system, which I talk about in this video. At the end, I explain how the tonal system based on triadic harmony and how harmonic progressions are the main structural basis of modern Western music, the conventional types at least. <laughs> Now, the last chapter that I want to talk about is the concept of associations. This is something that's very near and dear to my heart because, unfortunately, most people, they think of the history of music, especially around the Mediterranean, in a very simplified form where they look at Greece and they say, huh, Greek music sounds Eastern. Well, why do they have Maram Hijaz in Greece? Oh, well, the Turks invaded. That must be it. Or or maybe it's just because they were near the Middle East and the Middle Easterners brought it to them. Or maybe it was the Persians who invaded. Or maybe it was the Arabs. And not once does do people think, well, why couldn't it have been the Greeks who brought it over to the Middle Easterners? Because that's what the evidence shows. The evidence that we have available makes that scenario far more probable. 
And then they say, well, it's impossible. Why is it impossible? Because it doesn't sound Eastern. Okay, things sounding like something is our modern association. We form modern associations, but that's our associations. So like uh, people in the Anglosphere, for the most part, uh, tend to exclusively associate bagpipes with the Celts because of the Scots. Uh, bagpipes, okay, they sound Celtic. It sounds Celtic to them. It's associated with Celticness to them. But the problem is people go from this, this association and just assume that it's indicative of the actual objective origins in nature. It's not. Bagpipes are not Celtic by origin, and the Celts may have been one of the last ethno-linguistic groups on earth to get their hands on bagpipes, which have a more Near Eastern or Middle Eastern origin. Um, so our associations are worth nothing. They don't matter. It's about the actual evidence, right? Um, so just because something sounds like the Middle East, that's our modern association today. Um, so a good example for me is, you know, you look at Mesopotamian music and Greek music, you can do this, you can do this exercise with anybody, and I guarantee you the results are almost always going to be the same. You give them the major scale, which is typically thought of as very European sounding, and then you give them Maram Hijaz, which is typically thought of in pop culture as very Eastern sound, sorry, Eastern sounding, and you tell them one of these came from Mesopotamia over to Greece, and one of them seemingly comes from Greece over to the Middle East. Which one is which? I guarantee you, 99.99% of people are going to say, oh, the major scale must come from Greece because it's Western, and the Maram Hijaz must come from uh, Mesopotamia because it sounds Mesopotamian. So they're going to go off of their associations, what things sound like to them. And they're not going to be looking at the evidence. And the evidence actually shows it to be the other way around. Um, another example that I always use is flamenco. Now, everybody around the world is so... Um, complacent in their certainty that oh flamenco is just because of arabic influence of course arabic influence shaped the way flamenco sounds right now but the problem is when people say that it's arabic influence they think that it's literally anything that they associate with easternness so for example in flamenco music you have the maram hijaskar you have the frigid mode you have these styles of singing they're very ornate and everything People think that those are necessarily Arabic influence. And before the Arabs came, Spanish music was like super Western sounding. And only after the Arabs came did it start sounding like this. But the double harmonic major in the frigid mode. both existed in ancient Greek music and we know the Romans propagated ancient Greek music to an Iberian perspective from an Iberian perspective the Maram Hijaskar would have been equated with the Latinization of, of the land as they became Latin speaking they would have picked up the Maram Hijaskar or at least something close to it using these tetrachords that were rooted in ancient Greek musical practice but this is a big mindfuck for most people because they cannot think of it as something Roman and Greek. They can only pick... But it, it, rem, it, it reminds me of camels and sand. I can't think of it. It sounds like pyramids. These are associations. We have to free ourselves from Hollywood tropes and stereotypes and look at the evidence only. If the evidence shows that to be true, saying, but it sounds like camels to me and I can only associate with Arabs is not a counter-argument that is valid to any degree. Um, and so, yes, of course, Arabic influence would have shaped flamenco, but maybe it's not as obvious as we may think. Maybe it's something more subtle, like the way they strum the guitar. Maybe those strumming patterns come from Arabic influence. Maybe the way that they use the guitar as percussions. Maybe the Iberians did not have many percussions, and maybe the whole percussional aspect comes from Arabic music. The point is we can't really pinpoint exactly. And my point is that the flawed interpretation that most people have of historical development of music in these regions is that they will just take for granted that something sounds eastern therefore must come from the east something comes western therefore must come from the west they look at a territory that is in europe geographically like spain and they see well it must have sounded western originally and if there's anything that sounds eastern to it it must be because of the arabs because they come from the east it's not that simple it's far more complicated things that sound eastern to us today sound eastern because of decades of being associated with that maybe they originated somewhere else and they developed that association later on etc etc you get the point the mediterranean was this big melting pot where influences came from left and right and it is to a point where you can't really ever necessarily pinpoint an exact origin with much ease and what sounds western to our ears is not intrinsic to the geography of the west 
what we call Western sounding, what sounds Western to our ears, is mostly what we think of when we're thinking of the tonal system that crystallizes in the Renaissance. A lot of medieval European music would not have sounded typically Western to our ears because it would have used other music theory elements. So the point is that people think of music theory and influences in those regions as these eternal things that have always existed and that are the natural properties of a certain region. If you're in the Middle East, whether 2,000 years ago or 1,000 years ago, that's how music sounds in the Middle East. People act like these elements work like phenotypes. You know, you look at how I look. Obviously, most of my ancestors are not from China from the last 4,000 years or from Scandinavia from the four, last 4,000 years. Samuel L. Jackson, of course, most of his ancestors are not from Sweden in the last 4,000 years. You can tell that he's from the African subcontinent in terms of long ancestry, um, you know, just by the way he looks. But music does not work like this. People act as if musical elements are intrinsic fabric of a certain region, as if the climate of the Middle East was uniquely designed to... Um, uh, to generate the double harmonic major as if it could have only been developed in deserts and arid. No, it has nothing to do with that. The double harmonic major may have very well been birthed by the Greeks next to the Mediterranean Sea and then later traveled to the Middle East and now we've developed an association with it. Um, so when we think of the development of music in this region, we have to think in terms of music theory elements techniques, divisions of the octave, math mathematical ratios that have no intrinsic belongingness to a certain climate or to a certain region. They are only parts of culture that are mobile, that are fluid, and that may travel to a different place using different conquests, different migrations, different cultural influences, and they may disappear from their place of origin or be lessened there and then continue to thrive in another region. That's how music works. Anyway, I think I've exhausted everything that I had to say on the Again, matter. Again, sorry for being redundant and, uh, you know, rehashing information that I talked about before. But I think that for many people, you know, sometimes people ask me these very wide questions and I have to direct them to like all the epic talking videos that I did so far. They have to watch all of them. And so I, I feel like this is a good summary, kind of like, you know, when you watch I don't know, a new e a season of a, of a new TV series and you haven't seen it in two years and they do a recap. Sometimes these are useful. So hopefully that would have been useful to some people. And you can, of course, go check out the other videos for more detailed information. Um, but I really have nothing more to say on the matter. This was Fari Fergie, and I shall see you soon for another epic talking. Goodbye.